Hello, good morning all of you. Today, today I welcome you all in this one day or I can say one day uh, webinar on bioinformatics and ocean of opportunities to leverage during lockdown. This event was organized by DAV College Bhatinda in collaboration with the DBT Star College scheme. I, Dr. Kriti Bukbukta, Exchange warm welcome you all and kindly join this webinar today. Now I invite Dr. Gurpreet Singh to let that webinar open. Uh, Associate Professor from Central University of Punjab, Bhatinda. Dear colleagues from Department of Physics, Biology and from other departments and my dear students, good morning to all of you. DAV College Bhatinda has been awarded the Star College Scheme by Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology by Government of India. Under this scheme, the Department of Physics and Chemistry have been sanctioned grants to strengthen the infrastructure of the labs and for conducting different programs like organized faculty development programs for teachers, project work for students, etc. In the same time, it also promotes the holistic approach in science streams and encourage interdisciplinary activities. Therefore, the Department of Physics and Biology have planned to organize a webinar on an interdisciplinary topic. Bioinformatics is an interdisciplinary field comprising the application of computation and analysis to interpret biological data. The data comprises of information content of DNA, finding of genes and its sequence comparison, collective behavior of biological elements, cellular and neural networks, etc. To get meaningful information from biological data, we need algorithm, which in turn depend on theoretical techniques. Here, mathematics and statistical physics play a major role. As most of the labs have been shut due to COVID-19, so there was a need to look at some online bioinformatics software for the statistical evaluation of biological data. Dr. Felix Bast is very kind enough to talk with us about this topic. So I'm extremely thankful to him to accept our invitation and uh, sparing his valuable time. Now I request our worthy principals, Professor Praveen Kumar Gargji to welcome our resource person. Our distinguished speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Felix Vast, Head of Department of Physics, Dr. Gurpreet Singh, Dr. Preeti Gupta, 
Dr. Amal Santosh, faculty members of our college, teachers from other institutions, and dear students. Good morning to all present in this webinar. On behalf of management, staff, and students of DV College Bhatinda, I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Felix Vass from Central University of Punjab in this webinar. As already explained by Dr. Gurpreet, Dr. Vass will deliberate on the burning topic of bioinformatics and ocean of opportunities to leverage during lockdown. This topic carries a lot of weight in the present scenario of ever increasing problems during this era of disastrous pandemic COVID-19. Having a commerce background, though I do not know much about the terminology of this topic, by Dr. Kriti that the topic relates to how to find the remedies to human problems from biological genes with the help of computer-based knowledge and information. I would like to congratulate the Department of Physics and Department of Biology for taking this big initiative for organizing this unique event relating to the current deadly environment around the globe. I am pretty sure that this talk by Dr. Bost will go a long way in enriching the knowledge of our faculty as well as students. Such program will satisfy the dire need of updating the faculty as well as students with the later development in their respective fields. I wish you all success for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now I invite. Yeah, I'm audible. Yes. Oh. Now let me share my screen. A brief introduction by Dr. Felix Bass. Dr. Felix Vaz, he is an associate professor at Central University of Punjab, Bhatinda. His life and education, he was born in Payanur, Kerala, India, gold medalist in graduation, MSc from University of Madras, PhD from Max, Japan. And in his life, the role model is Carl Sagan, an American astronomist. His research and contributions, he discovered three new species of marine algae, from Indian coast, which was named after him. He is a principal investigator of 10 research and teaching grants from different agencies like UGC, DSG, Ministry of Earth Sciences, ICSSR, and Indian Academy of Sciences with a funding of total 1.5 crore rupees. He published more than 50, 70 peer reviewed publications in national and international journals and three books. Now moving to his awards and recognition, he is a recipient of INSA Inspire Faculty Award from DSG, Government of India 19, in 2012. He also served as an invited in residence intern with President of India as an inspired teacher for one week at Rashtrapati Bhavan, New Delhi in 2015. He received the prestigious NAM Lebanese International Fellowship and underwent three months research as a guest scientist at ZMT Bremen, Germany in 2018. He is inducted into the program advisory committee of DST served by government of India, as well as consultative group of principal scientific advisor to the government of India in 2019. He received teacher innovator award from MHRD government of India in 2019. And recently he is elected as a science diplomat of SARC member nations. Now influence. Uh, he undertook a 36th Indian expedition to Antarctica as a part of Ministry of Earth from December 2016 to April 2017. An avid cyclist who commutes daily on his cycle, an advocate of zero waste and low carbon footprint lifestyle. He is also a frequent blood and plasma donor and kitchen gardening and composting hobbyist. Signed up, uh, he also signed up 
for post death full organ and whole body donation with noto by ministry of health and family welfare government of india and you all know he is also involved with the science education and popularization with a number of science outreach talks at schools libraries colleges and universities he regularly delivers outreach talks via his youtube channel and also a founder of weekly curiosity episodes on his youtube channel which summed up the latest developments from the world he is a known writer with his contributions regularly appearing in resonance science reporter dream 2047 the hindu the times of india and many more now i invite dr felix to please uh, accept our invitation and share your views on the bioinformatics as a topic on for your talk oh uh, yeah yeah thanks a lot dr priti and uh, dr gurpreet singh and dr pravin garg uh, for uh, inviting me to be part of your uh, star dbt scheme and i'm really privileged to be here and uh, dr priti it's, it was a big introduction i was not expecting so many slides uh, you did a good effort on it thank you so much uh, it was totally unnecessary it wasn't necessary and uh, i'm really happy to be associated with dab college once again uh, you know it, this is the second program basically uh, relayed over the internet the first one was the uh, zero waste uh, series uh, after massive success of the zero waste i'm really happy to be with uh, this dab college is very close to my heart and of course this is not second program before that also in person i visited your college and i'm really impressed with your garden and your library your facilities and commitment by the teachers a big congratulations to dv uh, college team now coming to my presentation allow me to share my screen yes so that is uh, going to be the next uh, maybe 45 minutes and i'm going to uh share my views and it's going to be very simple but in case you find it difficult you are welcome to interpret interrupt me at any time so the talk is entitled bioinformatics in age ocean of opportunities to leverage during lockdown so during the lockdown how to leverage the bioinformatics to get things done so how do you uh, contribute towards the fight of covid 19 we all want to work on covid 19 but everybody says that well we don't have any uh, you know bsl uh, bio safety level 2 or 3 facilities we cannot culture the corona virus we don't have any lab we don't have any funding all these complaints set aside still you can contribute uh, towards the fight of covid 19 if you know how to work with bioinformatics software so this talk is especially on the bioinformatics I request all of you to mute. Please mute all of your phones. Okay, so there is disturbance. I request all of you, my teachers, colleagues, please mute your phones. Yes. Yeah, so uh, this talk is especially on the COVID nineteen. Uh, this one is. I'm going to concentrate more on the the COVID nineteen because that is the the you know the topic of discussion. It has a tremendous impact. these are testing times of all of our life so the focal point of today's talk so the toc of the talk is the story of moderna am rna 1273 what is that story i'm going to tell you about and the drug discovery second approach is combinatorial chemistry i'm going to introduce what this combinatorial chemistry is all about rna i approach for mrna uh, rna i approach for covid 19 evolution origin of the sars cov 2 and what is something called d614g the media is talking quite often bbc relays several news about d614g even times of india i'm surprised one you know times now has actually laid on d614g concerned with covid 19 what is that all about we will also see some other examples a birds eye view of the bioinformatics so that is the the way of the today's talk uh, yes so coming to the moderna so still i can see a lot of disturbance so could you please mute uh, all of your phones i can still see some disturbance uh, perhaps i can mute okay 
All right. So we talk to modern. Uh, modern is basically a. Form. Sorry, I, I I still see some disturbance. Fifty Sanvi Bhatia, please mute the form. Moderna is a, a pharmaceutical giant from uh, US. So it's an American drug discovery company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So what is drug discovery all about? As the name says, this is a discovery of the new drugs as well as vaccines. So discovering new drugs and vaccine, for example, vaccine against, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2. That is what uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, drug discovery is all about. You might know the vaccines, there are different kinds of vaccine. Well, this is an example of HIV, the vaccine development process. So there are multiple kinds of vaccine. One example would be whole inactivated vaccine. Uh, inactivated vaccine, one good example would be poliovirus vaccine, one of the first vaccines ever discovered. So poliomyelitis vaccine, we all get it, right? All the polio vaccine is alive, but inactivated vaccine is also there. Now coming to the live attenuated, attenuated means that uh, it cannot make infection, right? Live attenuated vaccine, one good example would be MMR, that is mumps, measles, rubella, and chickenpox vaccine. So these two are the classic two vaccine, and now all these are new developments in the field of vaccine. Uh, you know, uh, so all these new development can be summarized as subunit or recombinant or conjugate vaccines. One examples would be hepatitis B vaccine or HIV vaccine, you know, hemophilus influenza type B vaccine. So uh, this one is a recombinant viral vector vaccine. And this is synthetic peptide. So basically these are antigens. So you are actually administering antigen to the blood so that our body will produce antibodies against this antigens antigens basically these are protein molecules of the infectious agents the pathogens so recombinant viral vector vaccine is basically a, uh, you know it's a virus uh, which cannot infect but it's a live virus but the viral genome has been edited to integrate antigen presenting moiety from the disease for example uh, you know the coronavirus uh, that is sars cov 2 that is uh, the, uh, the virus, transmitting coronavirus, right? So we can actually cut its genome and integrate into the adenoviral vector. So this is basically an adenovirus expressing the protein from the, you know, proteins from the, uh, this one, uh, uh, proteins from the virus. So this way we can actually do that, right? So this is uh, one example of this, uh, uh, this, this kind of vaccine is do existing. This is called Chadox. Uh, and cough one vaccine by the Oxford University and AstraZeneca. So their method is recombinant viral vector vaccine, but of course, for recombination, you really need a wet lab works, you know, genetic engineering works. But Moderna's vaccine is something like this. Moderna is a totally bioinformatics way. It is a DNA vaccine that you can see it here, but Moderna is actually an RNA vaccine. And as you know, the coronavirus is an RNA virus, a single stranded of uh, a plus sense RNA virus. So you can actually create, uh, you know, the uh, the vaccine just for, by the knowing the sequence data of the coronavirus. So how did the Moderna develop this vaccine? Just if you look at the timeline of this coronavirus vaccine, uh, January 11 of 2020, this year's beginning, Chinese authorities sequence a whole genome and submit the sequence to NCBI GenBank. So by the way, anybody can generate the sequence and you can submit to the GenBank if you want the world knows what the sequence is. So if you're committed to, to fighting against COVID-19, you have to submit the, the sequence. Well, by the way, NCBI is an American uh, public repository that consists of the sequence. We, our team here in Central University has submitted more than 500 sequences to NCBI. So January 11, the, the, they submitted the whole genome to the NCBI and now look within Four days, within three days, January 13, uh, National Institute of Health and Moderna identified the gene in the viral genome calling for the spike protein, that is S protein. So basically, if you look at the structure, you can see the red, red color triangular shape structure, right? This is nothing but the spike protein. And this S protein or the spike protein is the one which attaches to our lung you know, the mucilaginous cells in the lungs and these lungs and kidney and heart, all these, uh, you know, cells, uh, the, the muscle cells or the li lining cells, the mu uh, you know, cells have got a, a receptor called ACE2, that is angiotensin uh, converting enzyme 2. 
so this receptor is a target of this spike protein you know so if you can actually create the spike protein and administer to our body our body will think that it is a virus and the body will start manufacturing the antibodies against the the coronavirus so that is exactly what the, what is happening here so just by looking at the ncbi sequence team from modern or they are just sitting in front of a computer they identified that this gene is the one which is making the spike protein let us actually uh, synthesize the gene and then integrate into a functional mrna to make the first available vaccine for the coronavirus so february 7th uh, they completed the vaccine manufacturing within 25 days and and by 24th of february moderna ships the vaccine to the nih for phase 1 clinical trial so any kind of vaccine needs elaborative human clinical trials to see the safety and efficacy does the vaccine works or is the vaccine is safe all these things are really important you know so that is what the clinical trials will take a really long time you need a lot of statistical testing uh, hypothesis testing p values all these are needed uh manufacturing the vaccine the mrna vaccine itself is not that uh or even chadox vaccine whatever the vaccine be uh the testing is rigorous because uh, we don't really need any error in the vaccine development so uh, you know uh, saving thousand lives or preventing death of thousand which is more important you know so that, that all depends upon the human ethics right the question here yeah. so if this is a, the the genome section of the chinese uh, you know the genome which chinese uh, authorities submitted in the ncbi and the american company immediately worked on it to identify that this section is the one which is responsible for the s protein on the spike how did they know it because they actually Uh, did a multiple sequence alignment with re related sequences from NCBI. Look, all these are related sequences of coronavirus family, and all these have got the spike protein here. So then, definitely, this section is going to be the spike protein of our coronavirus. They identified it. This is called homology, uh, you know, sequencing or homology modeling to find exactly where uh, the, the you know functional genes are. or this is also known as annotation genome annotation wherein you are actually saying that this section codes for a gene these are non coding sequence all these things are genome annotation that's very important part of the bioinformatics so once you have this one this particular gene what you do is you have to synthesize that gene and incorporate that into an mrna so once you have the gene you can synthesize it and you all you have to do is to put a poly a tail poly adenosine tail and 3 dash utr and 5 dash untranslated region that is utr is untranslated region so 3 dash and 5 dash and then 5 prime cap so in between if you put that coding region then you are going to get a functional mrna ready to inject into the patient it's amazing uh, you know way of uh, progress in the molecular biology friends and how do you synthesize they told you to synthesize a coding region from the sequence from ncbi the americans synthesized it from the chinese uh, you know the uh, sequences which they uploaded into the genbank database so you need oligo synthesizer so this is what the companies do if you really want to order a primer you know oligo nucleotide primer you submit you just email the company this is a primer sequence i want the company will make it for you this is a uh, synthetic biologist uh, you know charm in one day whatever the sequence of a gene you want uh, the uh, you know the company to synthesize this is one of the excellent equipment h8se it's a german made equipment which is very popular for oligonucleotide synthesis so american synthesized their uh, you know the oligo that is the gene sequence by that machine and they incorporated into the synthetic viral mr so basically this mr is completely synthesized you might know genetically engineered organism right or gmo yes this is a gmo this is a genetic engineering they did it and now oh, after synthesizing this this mute okay so mitu wadia please mute yes synthetic viral mr na so right so this synthetic viral mr na when you uh, incorporate when you inject into the patient especially onto the lymph uh, you know lymphocytes or lymph nodes and what our body does that our uh, 
uh, cells, ribosomes in our cytosol will translate it. You know, this viral mRNA gets absorbed into our body and our body start translating it and to form this, uh, you know, these uh, uh, viral proteins. So the proteins are going to be synthesized after translation. So this is very, very important that our body starts making these viral proteins. So RNA vaccine technology is that, as I told you, RNA coding to the antigen when we inject thymus or other lymph nodes. So it gets entered into our cell, you know, and in our cell, our body start translating it to synthesize a protein. So the protein synthesis is happening by our body and antigen is being presented. And then this antigen will be identified by our immune system cell, for example, NK cell and T cell. And that produces the antibody response uh, to uh, this, uh, this particular, uh, you know, antigen. That is basically the spike protein. That is how they are actually developing this thing. So this is a short video. You can see that video. So mRNA-1273 Moderna's potential thing. उसके बाद ये समझ Yes, so that is what the drug discovery is all about. So now coming to the second point of the drug discovery, it's not only about the, the vaccine. Uh, how about therapeutics? The, the therapeutics means, the, uh, you know, the, this is basically about the medicine or the drugs for the COVID, how to treat it. If you already got COVID-19, the vaccine doesn't work, right? Vaccine is to prevent it, right? So therapeutics have got two approaches. First is a classical approach, which is bioactivity screening, trial and error tinkering. So basically, as you know, the modern medicine, almost 90 percentage are coming from the plants, so plant extracts. I'm not saying about Ayurveda, I'm saying about the, the modern medicine. Some people criticize it as allopathy. Allopathy is a derogatory term. Please never use allopathy. I told this multiple times in my YouTube videos. Instead of that, always say modern medicine. So many people think modern medicine is all chemistry, chemical, synthetic chemical, nasty chemical, nothing like that. You know, it's all from the plants. 90% are from the plant extracts or it's analog, you know. So plant extracts, you can test against the suppression of SARS-CoV-2 cell lines. So this is how the classical approach is all about. So what are the cell lines? Basically, the cell lines are the, the, the human uh, cells which grow in the lab, uh, the tissue culture, the, the animal tissue culture, basically, where you can grow your coronavirus. So two popular cell line is HEK293 and where E6 cell line. These two cell lines are very popular for COVID-19 culture. Mind that you cannot culture in your normal lab. You know, you need biosafety level three. So it's the topmost lab, only few, very few labs are there in India for, with this facility. Now, which plant extract to choose? We have got 8.7 million eukaryotic species, you know, and which one to choose? We can simply try and error, you know, different things. We'll see, we can try, we can try turmeric, we can try coconut, we can try rice, we can try dal, I mean, whatever you want to try, you know, or rose or lotus, anything, you know, 8.7 million. And how do you extract it? You can use chemical extraction method with the solvent, solvent extraction. Usually people use four different types of solvents like aqueous, that is water, 
alcohol, phenol, and chloroform. So now you see the total permutation, 34 million kinds of extracts you're going to get. And each one, you can try test it in these cell lines for the coronavirus. Is it actually preventing the growth of coronavirus or not? It takes a long time and it's massively expensive and rampant red tape bureaucracy prevents export of the medicinal plants in most of the countries. For example, from India, if you want to take some Indian Ayurvedic medicinal plant to, uh, you know, some other place, uh, please stop, uh, you know, uh, this annotation for Deep Singh or any other participant in the Zoom, please stop annotation. Uh, yes, so, uh, you know, the red tape bureaucracy is prevalent. So it prevents, so in, from India, from Ayurvedic plants, if you want to transport to Canada, you need a hectic clearance. So usually the government deny it because Canadian companies can make money out of Indian plants. There is a reason that people prevent all these exports of these medicinal plants. So it is not practical and it's laborious and very expensive. Still, we have uh, several of the plant extracts. You know, the first time when the coronavirus came in news, this plant extract from Simcona bark in Amazonian rainforest, the Quechua tribes, uh, they have been using it for anti-malarial treatment for hundreds of years. Uh, this is called hydrochloroquinine or HCQ. That was the first uh, ever uh, medicine which uh, were all over used. But nowadays we know it, HCQ is not that effective. But this, uh, I have covered this in Curiosity, my, uh, my science program in my channel. In case you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to my channel. I do have a weekly science show for curiosity that sums up 10 most important findings in every week. So in cell studies, yet another paper, trial and error method, which they followed. In cell studies, seaweed extract outperforms Remdesivir in blocking COVID-19 virus. So Remdesivir is, an, uh, is a drug which everybody uses these days. So I will talk about Remdesivir also in today's presentation. So complex sulfated polysaccharides of fucoidans extracted from the seaweed, Saccharina japonica, that is basically, a, uh, you know, a brown seaweed or kelp, uh, the polysaccharide or sulfated polysaccharide called fucoidans can, uh, you know, fight the COVID-19 virus in the culture. So that's an exciting news. That is also a part of the trial and error, uh, though it doesn't work much. The issue here is that it's actually on cell lines and uh, tons of treatment show problems, but like for example chloroquine. So until you have put them into the human trials, all is just uh, hype and hypothesis. So I've covered that in the curiosity as well. Now coming to our second approach, exciting approach is called combinatorial chemistry approach for finding the drug. This is exactly all about the bioinformatics. Uh, combinatorial chemistry approach is also Drug design or rational drug design. So here what is happening is that coronavirus characterization is done by a structural uh, biologist or a biophysicist, you know, with an X-ray crystallography. So they look at this uh, virus, they purify it, they crystallize it, uh, you know, and they put this crystal inside this vacuum chamber and they actually put this through the laser. You know, this is where you keep the sample and this is an organ light, the laser is produced and this X-ray is basically the electron flow, you know, X-ray, the, they actually look at this image. So this is something called X-ray crystallography. It's very much part of the proteomics. So proteomics is all about characterization of the proteins. So once you have the protein structure, three-dimensional structure of protein, you can submit that to the PDB bank, that is basically protein database, uh, uh, you know, uh, that is also by the RCSB is maintaining this PDB. So it's something like NCB at GenBank, but this is for the protein structure. So this is a first step, independent step. So the lab specializing on uh, X-ray crystallography doesn't do any screening work. They just produce the, the crystal structure, uh, you know. Now, this is this is entry. So if you search in the PDB 6VXX, this is a database identifier. This is structure of the SARS-CoV-2 spike. Glycoprotein, closed state. So the, everything has got two, two accession, open state and closed state. So this is a closed state structure in the PDB. So now that we have already have structure, this is a receptor, the spike protein, three dimensional structure. This is just a, a schema, you know, just to give a, what is really happening. Now, this one, if you have some compound that can actually, uh, you know, stick correctly with these grooves, something like lock and key, then it can prevent, uh, you know, we can prevent this virus to attach onto our cell. 
So we have to find ligands from this, uh, you know, that can attach onto the receptor. So plant extracts ligands. So which ligand to choose? So that is exactly what is this uh, docking is all about. So now from ligands, you can just go to the natural product library, the thousands of, uh, I mean, hundreds of natural product libraries available. Uh, you know, one of my favorite is inter-bioscreen library. So inter-bioscreen, you can actually dock it. These two things. So one is the receptor spike protein with inter-bioscreen library of different natural plant extracts. You know, these are all chemical structure. This is the species one, species two, species three, and species four. We now have got four plant species here. One, two, three, and four. And which one will actually bind to the coronavirus grooves so that it cannot attach onto our host body? What is your guess? Any of the participants can say? Neha Gandotra, what is your guess, Dr. Neha? Or Geetika Singla? Anyone here? Could you be able to hear me? All is well? Yes, all is well. Yeah, so which one will you guess? That is what, it's an interactive uh, discussion. So please uh, interrupt and speak. Yes, Neha, you can unmute yourself. Answer the question. Uh, uh, I uh, the, the blue one. Yes, the blue one. Correct answer. Because the blue one has got this kind of this like a lock, and this is the key, right? So if the blue plant extract is being used, it will simply uh, put onto it, right? So this is what is all about the Gibbs and Helmholtz equation. You know, this delta H is Helmholtz equation, and this is delta G is the Gibbs, uh, you know, free energy. So it's connected with enthalpy and entropy. Delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. You might have studied in physics, right? School physics. So this is what, uh, how to minimize this delta G. That is a trick here. So aim is to minimize this delta G to achieve very good ligand substrate docking. So any kind of software, a lot of free software is available. You can do this at home to find which an, uh, natural plant product is really good uh, that can actually attach to uh, you know, the coronavirus spike proteins. So this is the, the, the purple ligand. Now you can see delta G is 88 kilo joule more minus one, well, basically per more. That is a kilo joule, uh, you know, or a kilo calories per mole is the unit of this uh, Gibbs free energy. Now uh, coming to the green one, it is seven. So it's much, much better. The seven fit is much, much better because delta G is lesser. Now coming to uh, this yellow uh, plant extract, it's so much higher, 124. The fit is not at all good. As you can see in this figure, it's not fitting properly, it's so big, right? So you need uh, the, the dimensionality as well as you need the appropriate size. Usually small molecules are always preferred. Now coming to uh, this one, this blue one, it's almost fitting perfectly fine, right? So the delta G is minus two. So if you have another extract with the delta G is still lesser, like for example, minus 200, so definitely that extract you have to check. So minimizing this Gibbs free energy is the key. So free molecular docking softwares are available from different organizations, for example, University of Basin, in Switzerland, Mayo Clinic, University of Southampton, Merck, all these universities have actually released it. Leipzig, all these are the programs you can use at home in front of your computer. You can do this work, you know, you don't need any funding for this. You can do it. You can even publish the data. You know, that is exactly uh, one of my friend, Dr. Shashank from Central University of Punjab, he did it and he published it was, uh, you know, his, uh, his uh, uh, paper about the core and uh, uh, two, uh, what are the potential uh, targets and potential plant extracts that can do it, you know? So Gilead is another very important, very big uh, pharmaceutical giant in the US. They identified Remdesivir as uh, one of the candidates for that can work against the SARS-CoV-2, uh, you know? So the target is something called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase or RDRP because this one is a 
plus strand single strand rna virus it's not a retrovirus like hiv but it's a ss rna virus you know so this lead identified rem desivir all through uh, the docking study so if they can do it we can also do it isn't it so this is another paper published in international journal of antimicrobial agents and this paper says a chloroquine is also binding to the protease of the sars cov 2 that is why preliminarily uh, we found positive good news about the chloroquine on the sars cov 2 because it can molecularly get down to uh, the protease enzyme of this uh, virus you know and i've covered this in the curiosity that uh, the, the llama south american animal this is also now a good candidate for the our fight against sars cov 2 why because the llama has got nano antibody the nano bodies its ig immunoglobulin g is extremely small it can actually fit properly into the cov 2 spike uh, you know rbd spikes so that is why the llama came in news i've covered this in the curiosity coming to the next approach is rna i approach what is this rna i it's like it was actually a trending term uh, almost two years back now or so i mean uh, it's not that very popular but still rna i so many people are working on it so rna i is all about interference or rna silence basically it's a deviation of the mrna mrna is a messenger rna so as you know uh, um, after transcription the dna produces an mrna and mrna escape from the uh, from uh, nucleus to the cytosol and in the cytosol this mrna finally goes to the ribosomes for translation to produce a protein right so before this translation happens if this mrna can be uh, you know degraded that is called rna interference so if you have an mrna of the spike protein you can synthesize a small rna molecule that can bind perfectly with this mrna so that this translation doesn't work you know that is called rna interference i hope Uh, the concept is clear to all of you so this is a ground breaking discovery this is a natural also in our body also our body produces rna i to silence the expression of the genes in developmental pathway so these two gentlemen andrew z fire and craig c mello won the nobel prize for physiology of Medi or medicine 2006 for this landmark discovery of rna i so as you see the rna i of the two kinds you know drosha and diser are two enzymes that actually work for it so basically the two kinds are si rna and mi rna si rna is small interferon rna while mi rna is basically micro rna so micro rna is more or less natural with the uh, imperfection with the hairpin loops while si rna is synthesized uh, and you know it perfect, perfectly fits so that you know uh, passenger strand is cleaved so the cleave happens on both these things so basically so mrna cleavage happens in this case cleavage plus translation repression plus mr uh, mrna degradation so both these molecules can be used for rna i so now you should know how exactly our uh, the sars cov 2 enter into our cell this is the molecular mechanism or entry pathway or the you know the the transduction pathway molecular pathway this is our spike protein right the spike protein of the rna uh, I mean, coronavirus uh, s protein which i told you This spike protein attaches to the ACE2 receptor. So ACE2 is basically angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So this receptor is really important. This is where exactly the the initial contact. This cell is our cell. You know, this cell is basically host cell. For example, in our lungs, uh, you know, alveolar cell has got ACE2 receptor. So this ACE2 is the place where uh, coronavirus attaches. So one potential way. It prevent the attachment of the uh, coronavirus to our cell is if you prevent the expression of ACE2 on the cell, or if you mutate this ACE2 to some other form. You know, two forms are there. So ACE2 is of course coded by a gene, and if you stop this ACE2 from expressing much onto our cell, that will prevent the attachment of SARS-CoV-2 onto our cell. But of course, it it has got uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Cons as well because it's a zero sum game. ACE2 is an enzyme; uh, it's very important for vasoconstriction. So of course, ACE2, uh, you know, inhibition drugs are there. If you have a heart failure or heart attack or you know any case of uh, uh, high blood pressure, then definitely you have to take some medicine to stop the ACE2 from action, right? 
So all in, that is what ARBs are all about, or TMPRSS2 inhibitor. All these drugs are uh, against the ACE2 and TMPRSS receptor. Right? I'm not going too deep, but the two ways uh, to to integrate the RNAi into the SARS-CoV-2 uh, as a, a therapeutic ACE, uh, you know, expression of ACE2 can be uh, curtailed by RNA press or expression of this spike protein on the cell. So the both op options are open to us. So this is the paper, Prospects of RNAi Therapy for the COVID-19 in Front in Bioengineering and Biotechnology. So the two target, as I told you, host or the virus spring, virus. So host is silencing the expression of the ACE2 receptor. Of course, it's uh, it's tricky because it's, we need ACE2 receptor. And if you silence expression, we might face some other serious ramification, for example, uh, very low BP and dizziness and nausea I and mean, lots of complications might be there. Better approach is on the pathogen, silencing the expression of the S glycoprotein and then E, M and N protein. So all these are glycoproteins on the spike protein, you know? So if you can silence it, you can do it. Coming to the next part of my talk is on evolutionary origins of SARS-CoV-2. This is another work you can do at home. You know, by using the computers and you can publish uh, the data, you know, quality data you can generate and you can even try to get it published. So there is something called phylogenetic. That is actually what my work here in the university is all about. So the phylogenetics workflow is basically first, uh, you know, you need to uh, barcode and generate the DNA sequence and upload that into the NCBI. Well, this part is that if either you do or somebody else do, you know, you can you can make use of the NCBI. NCBI has got uh, millions of sequences so you can make use of those sequences and do the analysis so you know this is something called data mining it's a database you can mine the database for the required uh, data and you can construct the alignment you can curate it and you can use the and render it so this is completely in silico work so you can do this in silico work to do that so they did the same thing. Evolution of original SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, you know, lineage responsible for COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is a team, a UK and US-based team, especially from the uh, University of Glasgow. Uh, the Robertson is the lead author, University of Glasgow, published in Nature Microbiology. I've covered this in uh, Curiosity as well. So they did a fantastic study just by the data mining. And uh, they, you know, uh, I always look at the method section of any paper. So, how do they do that? so you can see that SARS-CoV-2 virus data, 68 sequences, uh, you know, from the GenBank database, uh, COF OC43 data, for, uh, 27 human coronavirus genomes uh, from the, uh, you know, this one, uh, the database, and MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV, MERS is basically Middle East, uh, the virus, you know respiratory syndrome virus also related to the cov2 or sars cov all these are 69 and 35 all these genomes they found from the ncbi database i've covered this in the curiosity as well and they they use the bayesian divergence time estimation so bayesian inference is a statistical or computational phylogenetic tool to uh, construct the tree so they they use the bayesian uh, analysis and then they found that the leaves that gave rise of virus has been circulating in the bats for decades and likely includes other viruses with the ability to infect the human beings. And two spillover events per year has been happening for the last one century due to wildlife trade and deforestation. So spillover event means from wilderness coming to the human being. So the first such event is something called spillover event. You know, so divergence dates between SARS-CoV-2 and the bad SARS-CoV-2 were estimated as 1948. So that, that means from 1948 itself, they, they emerged it, the SARS-CoV-2. So lineage giving rise to SARS-CoV-2 has been circulating unnoticed in bats for decades. So it's all about the, uh, the biodiversity, uh, you know, uh, degradation is responsible for this thing. Now, if you go back in time, this is a paper published in a journal called Clinical Microbiology Reviews in 2007. And this is Vincent C.C. Cheng et al. The title is Severe Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus as an Agent of Emerging and Re-Emerging Infection. A very old paper, 2007. And this is the abstract of that paper. They did the same thing, the phylogenetic study. And now you see that the, the end, the, the final sentence. Let me read out. 
the presence of a large reservoir of sarcov like viruses in the horseshoe crab bats horseshoe bats is a kind of a bat together with the culture of eating exotic mammals in southern china is a time bomb you know they said that in 2007 it's a time bomb the possibility of reemergence of sars should not be ignored see this is really important way back in 2007 the authors said this and still we ignored it you know this is what uh, this is a meme internet meme at the start of every disaster movie there is a sign is being ignored so in paper in 2000 we continued by our trade and in alternative medicine because bush meat is uh, often time used in alternative medicine and there is a reason why we have now an emergent uh, virus is it only for the sars cov now for every single emerging diseases is happening for the last uh, uh, one century you see sars is from bats marburg is from bats ebola from bats nipah from bats uh, aids from primates mers is from camel i told you middle east uh, respiratory syndrome is from camel avian influenza h5 n1 is from birds it's one and one swine flu uh, it's actually swine flu means pig lime is from deer and rodents zika from exotic mosquitoes dengue from exotic mosquitoes so bats are coming uh, to be very dominant why bats what is so special about bats i covered everything in the curiosity please watch out i don't really have time to explain all these things so indiscriminate exploitation of the biodiversity is a root cause of all of our troubles that is what all this says biodiversity uh, thing so this is uh, another interesting thing about uh, you know that word of uh, g so it's a recent paper which they actually analyzed uh, you know the current coronavirus pandemic they completely did uh, the whole genome sequencing from different areas of the world and then they found that there is a very interesting new kind of a clade of the coronavirus is emerging and this is for this mutation point mutation so what is actually happening here as i told you remember this uh, the spike protein needs to dock on to the ace2 receptor right so of course this is a lock and key mechanism is not completely proper you know so if this uh, spike protein can dock on to the ace2 it much better that is much lesser delta g then it can uh, you know it is full proof it can actually uh, uh, infect a much better way so that is what the coronavirus is warning now this uh, you know big strain rajesh could you please mute dr rajpata please mute the phone rajesh batra please mute so this is a mutant strain of the coronavirus okay d614g uh, that is actually uh, it, it doesn't mean that this mutant uh, it's a killer strain nothing like that but it, the ability to trans you know transmit from one person to another is much higher you know infectivity is much higher for d614g so this is also detected by uh, you know the phylogenetic analysis so that is very interesting so this is what the normal coronavirus of wild type Uh, you know it can of course it can uh, uh, attach the ace2 receptor groups but d614g is almost perfect so it can easily attach and cause infection so there is a new variety of the coronavirus so d614g mutation in sars cov2 protein reduces s1 shedding and increases infectivity so it increases the infectivity that is what the paper says so all these things are the product of the bioinformatics trend so the, we have a ocean of opportunities in the bioinformatics so this paper if you look at the paper carefully this is where uh, the, the you know uh, this mutation happens so uh, if you look at the uh, you know timeline series data of uh, different these are basically uh, v a v l these are uh, you know the amino acids uh, operating of dna so the dna sequence translate into the amino acid right these are different amino acid letter code and january 2020 here there was a d amino acid d all these according for the amino acids 
February 2020 is also D is a dominant. 614G is a zero percentage. Now coming to April, now coming to March 2020, 614G started emerging. This is percentage of the trade. Could you please mute? I request again, please mute. Madam, please uh, say Rajesh, please call Rajesh, it's, uh, it's disturbing. Rajesh Mitra, sir, please uh, mute yourself. I Please mute yourself. 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 April, look, 65 percentage is now with G. Now, May 2020, 70 percentage of the G. So it is actually, uh, this is exactly what the evolution is all about. Change in uh, allele frequency in a population over time, over generation. That is called evolution. So it's evolving. You know, the coronavirus is evolving. So coming to the bioinformatics, a bird's eye view. So, you know, the bioinformatics is basically an interdisciplinary field with two pi, you can say biology and informatics, but it's not simple two pi, it's multiple pies together, vents together. This is a very famous quote by Darcy Thompson. Uh, you know, he's one of my favorite authors. He has written so many books, form and, uh, you know, on growth and form is his favorite book, my favorite book authored by Darcy Thompson. Uh, he is a Scottish morphometrician of 18th century, and his quote is that, let me tell you that the fertile field of discovery lies for the most part on those borderlands where one science meets another. So one science meets another. This kind of uh, intersection is where exciting uh, discovery is happening. That exciting so it's in structural chemistry, thermodynamics, Computer science, statistics, data mining, all together comes this bioinformatics. So if you look at this bioinformatics, which I haven't covered, scope is too vast. Medicine, for example, GWAS, that is genome-wide association studies uh, from case and control, you know, for example, breast cancer patient and normal people. So you can compare the, the genome of both, uh, you know, and to see that which are genes mutated in the breast cancer patients. Uh, you can do the statistical analysis. So that is called GWAS to discover the genes responsible for certain diseases. Uh, you can also use ecology and evolution, metagenetics and metagenomics. So that is basically complete sequencing of the entire population, uh, especially for the uh, you know virus or uh, you know the, the bacteria or phytoplankton. You can do this metagenomic or metagenetic analysis to see exact biodiversity. Population genetics and phylogeography, you can, you can analyze uh, within species spread in a, a vast geographical areas or phylogeography or population genetics, you can do all this by bioinformatics, friends. And also molecular systematics, basically classification based on the molecular data. That is also bioinformatics is being used. Artificial intelligence based plant identification apps like PlantNet or PlantSnap. Uh, if you haven't used, I strongly suggest you download these uh, apps into your Android phone. PlantNet is actually by American uh, Botanical Society. Uh, it's a free app, completely free app. And you can take that app, uh, uh, I mean, your phone, Android phone, to your garden. For example, DAV College has got a beautiful botanical garden. And then try to snap it. The app will tell you exactly which species is that. And they do that through the regression algorithm. Uh, it works with the artificial intelligence. So to develop that such kind of apps, you need expertise with AI or expertise with plant taxonomy. So that is uh, the beauty of all, all these apps and all this field of bioinformatics is all about. Morphometrics, I told you, Darcy Thompson is a very famous morphometrician. Morphometrics is based analysis of uh, structure, for example, flower or seed, 
or uh, pollen grooves, you know, tricorpate or bicorpate, all these things are, uh, you know, a part of the morphometric. So basically, you are analyzing the microscopic pictures uh, to compare and to classify and to group, you know, the principal component analysis, PCA, you can use that in the morphometrics. And uh, systems biology also, predictions of networks, interaction and pathway, for example, cancer, how the cancer is being virus is actually infection pathway all these you can do that or the metabolomics you might know you know metabolic pathways all these you can use the biomechanics for it biophysics of uh, a protein structure prediction homology modeling so a uh, prediction of the protein structure you know for example spike protein of the coronavirus so even before doing that uh, coronavirus spike we can predict, I mean, without even be, before this X-ray crystallography is done, you can predict the structure just by looking at the sequence data in silico, that approach is called in silico. Yeah, that means uh, using this, uh, you know, uh, silicon is commonly used to do the lab works. And biogeography in what sense you can use that in the you know biogeography there is basically dispersal pattern of the species for example how uh, pine trees are dispersed uh, all around Himalayas uh, to study it you don't really have to go there physically you can simply download the data set from uh, ISRO uh, the remote sensing database and you can use GIS uh, geological information system and bio bio uh, biodiverse informatics. Uh, you know, and you can actually make inferences and you can publish the data without even visiting, uh, 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 you know, Himalayas or Antarctic. You can uh, write papers on it. So that is exactly what the beauty of this, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, GIS is all about. Even linguistics, friends. Philo linguistics is an emerging field that combines a historical linguistics with phylogenetic analysis. You can trace the evolutionary patterns of languages, how the languages evolve. Uh, repeated philolinguistic papers confirm that Hindi, for example, is so much related to English and so much related to German than Hindi with Tamil or Hindi with Malayalam. You know, uh, of course, Hindi is so much related with uh, uh, Punjabi also because all these forms have a major family, language family called Indo Aryan language family. You know, English and Hindi are so much related than either with. Uh, Tamil or Kannada or uh, Malayalam, you know, that is the reason why we South Indians have troubles uh, with uh, understanding the Hindi. So genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, the medical insights, all these are the uh, sub-disciplines of the bioinformatics that students can pursue uh, their career. Afterwards, of the courses, uh, you know, uh, I suggest you if you're at home during the lockdown period, there are several uh, courses, uh, for example, edX, or Khan Academy, or Coursera, or even Swayam. I have a course in Swayam, uh, you know, Ministry of Education Swayam. So you can take all these courses completely free of charge. I've covered several of such videos uh, in my YouTube channel. So please go and check it out. So thank you so much, Tanawada, uh, and uh, please uh, watch those videos in, in the YouTube. If you have any doubt, please ask me. Yeah, thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful talk. And you, you know, enlighten our viewers about the COVID vaccine and various uh, techniques involved in making the de developing the vaccine, all and all that things. And moreover, you also touched the phylogenetic part and how what is DNA barcoding and how the trees constructed from the barcodes and what is gene sequences and all that stuff. I think my viewers are curious regarding these questions. Now, let me start the question answer session. Now, first of all, I invite from our participants, uh, they can directly ask the question from the sir. Yeah, you can unmute yourself and ask the, ask the questions from the sir. Yes, go ahead. Hello? Yes, Neha, you can ask. Sir, uh, uh, can I speak in Hindi? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Sir, we have Delta G. You have said that the negative will be made, it will be made of reaction feasible. We also have thermodynamics. Sir, according to me, if we increase the temperature, then we will be able to make the Delta G negative. Yes, that is all about enthalpy. Sir, this is all about enthalpy. 
जो आपने बताया ना कि यस यस somehow your question is breaking uh, you can type your question onto the chat box yeah okay sir yeah i mean uh, one one point uh, neha one point is of course you can increase the temperature but that is not practical right uh, in, uh, in in you know in biological system how can you increase the temperature to increase uh, you know the binding of course Uh, it's uh, it's proportional to the temperature as well but the temperature increasing is not practical so uh, we cannot heat our body you know so the only way is to increase the uh, the fit is uh, to decrease the entropy so basically that is what uh, the gibbs free energy system the thermodynamics is all about so in molecular docking uh, you know we only have structures with us two different structures the nothing temperature and all are completely controlled we, beyond our capacity we cannot control the pressure we cannot control the temperature nothing you know all we have in our disposal is uh, the structures the two uh, molecules uh, the ligand and substrate you know so the which uh, ligand is better to our receptor that is what uh, our uh, thing so this delta g is only a grading pattern just like your examination score so how do you call one person as the rank number 1 rank number 2 rank number 3 like the ranking we need some uh you know objective criterion to rank the fit you know the the ligand with the receptor so that is what the delta g is all about so whenever you do this kind of molecular docking with the free software the several software is available if you do that you can learn it yourself it's not a big deal and if you really want to help you can take a course through courser or edx completely free lots of courses are available and with that course you can write a good paper you know that is amazing that is what we can do it uh, uh, sitting at home you really don't even have to go to the lab so that is what i'm emphasizing on my talk yes any other questions uh, you can ask any general questions uh, you know about the novel coronavirus whatever that you would like to get it answered i'll try to answer your questions Madam, also please have a look on the YouTube. There might be some YouTube questions in the chat box. Okay. Ah uh, yes, yes, sir. There is one question from Shivani Verma. She is. Uh, she wants to ask. Could you please elaborate the which parts of the plants are used for uh, extracting out the extract for the uh, vaccine? Oh, uh, plant extracts as a vaccine. I'm not sure. Uh, in my opinion, uh, plant extracts cannot be used as a vaccine. You know, but plant extracts do work for uh, the the treatment. That is what the classical, uh, you know, the bioactivity based uh, approach for drug discovery, screening. You know, different kinds of plants you can screen. I told you, it's so much elaborative. Eight point seven million species we have. Multiplied with the four kinds of extraction, it's going to be huge fermentation. We don't really have time to do all this work. So that is why so many people publish crap uh, publications. Uh, for example, uh, you know some some medicinal plant against some disease uh, without any clinical significance. You know there is an IC50 value. It will be in micromoles. You know so micrograms uh, uh, makes no sense. Absolutely rubbish. But of course you can get those papers published in some uh, journals with impact factor. You know and those kind of papers will help you two things. As I always say, one thing is to get a job if you don't have any job. Second thing is that if you already have a job, it might help you to get a promotion. Other than that, zero clinical significance of all this uh, uh, plant extract bioactivity based analysis. Now, coming to your question, exactly which part of the plant is used? Uh, it could be anything, you know. For example, uh, you know, aspirin. Aspirin. I've been taking aspirin for quite some time. So, aspirin is basically acetyl salicylate, you know, salicylic acid, uh, acetyl ester. So, aspirin is actually from the willow tree, the bark of the willow tree. so the bark sap you know that is what the extract the plant extract. so it all depends uh, where the moisture is found uh sincona bark that uh, this hcq as well uh, chloroquinine so basically it's a quinine and hydrochloroquinine is basically chemically modified so that is a, a gene from the bark of the sincona tree 
So Mark do have several interesting things, so as leaves and so as some, so as some sometimes the fruits. You know, uh, it all depends uh, what exactly you are looking for. I cannot generalize it, and also uh, it's improper to say that the the plant extracts can be used as a vaccine uh, for the coronavirus. No, vaccine cannot be. Now over to Dr. Amar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kriti. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, it was really a fabulous uh, talk, and we learned uh, a lot from uh, this lecture. I hope our audience enjoyed this lecture too. The lecture will surely inspire or encourage uh, our students to go into research work in future. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sir. And now I would like to uh, go for participants' uh, queries. And uh, one query is, uh, what makes bats survive such viruses? Yeah, so, you know, this is basically a, a very fundamental question. I've covered that in uh, my earlier uh, videos as well. So uh, there are several things. So first of all, bats actually, they live really long. So they live like 30 to 40 years, one bat can live. So it is a disproportionately long life expectancy in a mammal, you know, and they're wild animals. So if they can live that long, so the virus can evolve inside the, the bats uh, thing. So an immune system of bats are really profound. They're really good uh, to prevent any of these emerging uh, diseases to attack the bats, you know? So it, it actually hosts different kinds of uh, the pathogens, but the pathogens cannot able to infect the bats. And much more importantly, bats are in ecology something called keystone species like elephants or like honeybees. You know, honeybee is a keystone species. Do you know why? Because honeybees, if you remove honeybee from an, a population, the entire ecosystem collapses because honeybee is a pollinator, right? So it's a major pollinator, plant pollinator. So in case of honeybee, now, you know, you might, if you read the news, science news, you know that honeybee populations are shrinking around the world. It's a, it's a, a, a reality. It's because of our, uh, you know, the use, uh, you know, in deliberate use of the pesticides uh, that is actually having uh, impacts, uh, you know, ramifications on the honeybee population. So if the, all the honeybees are dead, then pollination will not happen and the plants cannot fertilize and the entire ecosystem will collapse without plants. Animals also cannot live. So those kind of things are known as keystone species. So in the wildlife, bats are also a very important keystone species. And uh, that is one reason that, uh, you know, the, the, the bats actually uh, have uh, interaction with multiple animals, you know? So if bats are infected, it can actually transport to uh, so many different uh, animals, uh, you know? That is the reason that why bats are actually a uh, very important carrier uh, or vector for these uh, wild, emerging wild diseases. Now I would like to invite Ria to ask questions from the participants. Ria, you can ask your question from your sir. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Yes, Ria. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, so I would like uh, I would like to ask that uh, uh, a symptomatic coronavirus can be as. Uh, can be cured at the home, then why it is so called dangerous? No, it, it cannot be, see, curing or un, uh, not able to cure, it all depends upon the individual. So we really have no answer. How can we treat the coronavirus? So what we know so far is that the one common pattern, very common among all the COVID-19 infection is that it produces something called D-dimer in the blood. So the D-dimer lead to something called microclot you know, inside our blood vessels, uh, arteries, the blood start clotting. So this is a major reason why the people are getting uh, serious coronavirus infections. So now many people believe that if it's a asymptomatic infection without any, uh, you know, pro uh, uh, breathing problems or extreme fever, these are called asymptomatic. Though you're COVID-19 plus, you don't have any symptom. So those kind of people are fine you know, they will recover and, uh, you know, uh, successfully recovered patients. But nowadays the data is emerging again and again from different parts around the world, that even asymptomatic patients are not safe. 
even after they recover from the covid 19 they are still having their heart and lungs you know damaged and they would need a lifelong uh, anticoagulation treatment like aspirin or uh, uh, you know heparin so taking the the disease so lightly to say that uh, you know it was an asymptomatic infection and i recovered from the covid 19 no uh, you know that is not the case so it's basically mortality many people say okay mortality look at the mortality rate how many people died from covid 19 and that indicates the severity of the disease no mortality rate is only one aspect infection prevalence is the most important aspect you know and many people are saying i mean studies are actually saying that uh, it will have a huge impact on our next generation even the kids born uh, during this time will be more prone for type 2 diabetes because there is a connection molecular connection so all these things are uh, really i mean we we have no clues so only thing which uh, which is available to our disposal is to prevent the covid 19 infection from just uh, from getting infected for that we have got uh, uh, you know two important things to do one is to wear mask all the time and also what kind of mask i, I always advise people to go for a fabric mask with microfiber insert that is so much better than even n95 mask and it doesn't cost at all you can reuse it it's good for your planet earth second one is physical distancing so physical distancing even when you wear the mask so if you do these two things chances are very low that you will get infection you know that is what the uh, good i mean the uh, uh, places which won the race against covid 19 has done for example new zealand even pakistan uh, you know infection has you completely gone down yeah, so these two things if you do, and nowadays, especially in the places where infection rate is really prevalent, uh, epidemiologists are suggesting us to wear a face shield. So whenever you go to a mass, for example, a religious mass or a, a, a function of which you cannot avoid, for example, a, a marriage ceremony, I suggest you to wear, uh, you know, mask plus face shield. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to invite Azim to ask question. Azim, you can ask the question. Sir, uh, is there some study that said, uh, that suggests what is the difference between the uh, immune system of and bats, like uh, some molecular uh, differences or uh, something? Uh, what is your question again? Could you please repeat? Sir, have we done some studies on bat and uh, uh, animals, other animals? What is the difference between the immune system, uh, like molecular differences or uh, signaling differences? I don't know exactly what is the difference. There are lots, thousands of differences in the how the immune system works in bats with uh, uh, animals, I mean, uh, with other animals. And I have, you, you asked me, have I done any study? I didn't do any study, you know? I only read and understand that COVID-19 is very new to me like anyone else. I never worked on COVID-19 or any other diseases or bats, you know? I'm just sharing my information, what I know. And exactly what is the molecular differences in immune system of bats with other animal? I really don't know. You have to find out, you know? So definitely there are several differences. As I told you, you among the animal immunoglobulin structure differs vastly. Uh, IgG and IgM structure. Uh, I, I told you about uh, the llama, you know, uh, llama, not Dalai Lama, but llama is an animal, in a camel-like animal in the South America. So the South American llama immunoglobulin is very small. So that is why we are actually trying to use it as a vector to express the COVID um, coronavirus spike protein onto that, uh, uh, you know, immunoglobulins of the llama. And why llama immunoglobulin is interesting? Because it's very small. It can easily go to the grooves of the coronavirus spike protein. See, that is what the science is working. We are actually working day and night to find uh, uh, to find a treatment scenario for the COVID-19. Yes. Now I invite, invite Dr. Amar to ask questions from the participants. Uh, there is uh, another question. Sir, can you please explain briefly the impact of uh, biodiversity degradation on the emergence of COVID? 
Yeah, well, biodiversity is a very, very important topic. And I actually covered this one in the, my one of my talk entitled Karma. Uh, initially, I, ta- I gave the talk to the Punjab, Punjab University in Chandigarh, Botany Department arranged one colloquia. And the COVID-19, the, the, the thing is that basically, you know, in fact, the, 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 it's something like, a, you know, the a portfolio effect in ecology. You know, so an ecosystem with all, you know, all the different kinds of uh, species acts like a resilient, you know, any damage, nothing is going to happen. It's just like the stock market, you know, if you have a mutual fund, you know, and it's always better to diversify your portfolio, you know, so diversify means some debt, some equity and some uh, guild fund, all those things are always better. If you have all in equity, then what would have happened during the COVID-19 almost enter uh, some of whatever you own will be completely devastated now. It's only recently started recovering, you know. So that is called portfolio effect. So it's the same thing with the biodiversity. I mean, portfolio effect forests and go inside the forests, you know, uh, because of the mine project or bullet train, you know, or airport or a dam, uh, you know, big hydrothermal uh, power plants. Uh, hydro electric plants in the Himachal Pradesh and uh, other places contributing to the spillover events. So of course, the first main thing is uh, wildlife prey and bush meat. So bush meat is basically the wild meat. Many people love to eat the wild meat, you know, especially in um, China. Almost uh, 60 to 70 percentage of the bush meat trades happen in the China and also in African or places you know they like to eat the wild like for example uh, you know uh, porcupine or wild boar you know all this wild meat is really popular in china so people eat it and by eating it you are increasing the contact with the wilderness you know and chances of getting this emerging infectious diseases from the forest is increased another very important reason is alternative medicine uh, for example you know uh, uh, kida jadi in himalaya we, we say kida jadi is like a a cure for all, any kind of disease. Do you have a cancer? Go for a ketogenic. Do you have AIDS? No problem, you can treat it with ketogenic. Some people uh, quacks say that if you have ketogenic, it's like a you know, uh, panacea. Uh, one medicine, it can cure all the disease. It's, it's all nonsense, friends. Doesn't work like that. So, uh, you know, in alternative medicine, they have an inordinate fancy with uh, uh, anything that is rare. So it's like rare wine is more tastier and more precious. That that mentality, that it's a psychological bias, you know? So, uh, you, I mean, aphrodisiacs, there are lots of things, for example, monkey oil or snake oil, you know, they sell it in the alternative medicine, right? Or shilajit as an aphrodisiac, the sexual stimulant. Uh, studies have shown that it doesn't work. It's simple a myth. You know, but still alternative medicine uh, uh, proposed that. And the issue is that the alternative medicine directly contributes in biodiversity crisis is that they actually sell the rare species. So the rare important species gets lesser and lesser. You know, that will have a huge impact, tremendous impact on the emergence of the infectious disease like coronavirus. Yes. Yes. Sir, there is one question from Siva Chitri. Uh, she is going to uh, want to ask out of the various ligands which are plant based used for docking against spike protein uh, which one is the best as per your information and giving the good results well i have no idea you know this uh, docking study the issue here is that if you do the docking of course you can do a, get a paper you can publish that even in impact factor journals and uh, that those kind of paper will serve two purpose, you know, as I told you to get a job or get a promotion. Yes. But beyond that, these paper, the docking paper uh, need a, something called validation. That's very, very important stuff. Validation means that, okay, I found, uh, you know, one plant extract that works against the coronavirus. The issue now here is that, for example, we have lots of structure of the, uh, you know, the uh, active moiety of the turmeric. You know, so curcumin, the bioactive uh, molecule is known as curcumin. So that, that structure is there in the bio, uh, inter-bio screen library for the last 10 years or more, because that is one of the first ever compounds in this crystal, uh, crystal synthesized in India and we put up in PDB. And we have got 
thousands of papers on the efficacy of curcumin against various diseases but now that all these things they you know the the, the studies they, they always say that it works or it doesn't work so out of these thousands of paper there are some many studies did a meta analysis they compared the the data from one to another and they they made uh, you know a complete uh, recommendation that recent meta analysis of the curcumin says that it is not bioavailable so that means that whatever that uh, uh, you know the, the turmeric that we eat it's tasty it's it's very nice but it doesn't actually enter into our blood you know the curcumin is the most important compound if it doesn't enter into our blood then what is the point of all these papers so invalidated 6000 something papers there is a huge uh, controversy in the uh, recent controversy in uh, uh, the biology you know the pharmacology studies so just by saying that this plant extract is good for coronavirus is only a half a story the second half is validation validation means take the active compound and do that on the cell cell lines you know viral cell line which i told you and if cell line works is a promising then go to the, the clinical trials that's also very important unless you do that on a human being uh, you cannot say that it, it works or not yeah uh, yes sir you know there is a myth regarding the people of the india by drinking the turmeric milk they will get some immunity against the coronavirus and covid and i think most of the people are doing it in punjab also uh, verka has launched the turmeric milk so what do you what are your viewpoints on this myth no immune booster i have released a, a specific video only about the immune booster immune booster itself is non scientific so there is only one way to increase your immunity uh, that is by exposing to the antigen or getting by vaccine of course vaccine is only practical solution right because covid 19 is a life threatening disease so that is why even herd immunity is not practical many people say okay herd immunity is our final solace for covid 19 no it doesn't work because covid 19 is a life threatening disease and even if you are recovered successfully recovered your life long you have a artery coronary artery ischemic heart disease and lung disease chances are very high so the herd immunity doesn't work that way so immune booster is basically cheating it doesn't work and more than that more than cheating it's a it's a very important contributor why our india has such a huge prevalence of covid 19 because people believe in this nonsense that if you drink uh, you know ghee uh, with uh, milk lukewarm milk with honey and uh, you know uh, this uh, uh, lime you know nimbu pani and also some tulsi leaf and if you drink you are not you are go not going to get covid 19 and also if you do yoga you will not get covid 19 friends no these are all nonsense more importantly people what they do is that after drinking all these things jaggery in milk for example after drinking they go out without wearing mask they get positive you know one of my good friend died recently he believed in this immune uh, booster myth and because he was consuming these immune boosters even uh, there is a tablet called a uh, uh, supposed tablet tab it doesn't work it's also a pseudoscience it's called arsenicum album no arsenicum album is a complete pseudoscience so people believe that arsenicum album gives protection from covid 19 and they go out without wearing masks and without observing the, the physical distancing and they get the disease that is why uh, this prevalence is really common you know and even there are i even seen that uh, uh, some modern bread that says it's immune booster that, that's a typical uh, propaganda advertisement gimmick nowadays in india unfortunately any kind of thing even a bed i was surprised to see that in bombay there is a huge big advertisement a mattress a big mattress a company says that it is a immune boosting mattress if you sleep on it you will not get covid 19 because they mixed some tulsi leaves in it you know it's a cheating pure cheating please don't fall on to any of this myth the only two option available to you is to wear the mask plus face shield i would strongly suggest you then observe the physical distancing and wash your hands of course you know that is the only option over to dr amar hey, you are right uh, sir <laughs> these days many advertisements uh, are going on on such issues uh, that we provide this kind of uh, uh, material and it will uh, boost your immunity 
these are uh, just rumors. Uh, you are absolutely right. And sir, we have uh, another question uh, from uh, Nishtha Malhotra. Sir, can you suggest some certification course in bioinformatics? Yeah, I mean, I reviewed this one detail. You know, it is a, a it's it's not a, a big uh, uh, video. Please look at that video. I have actually reviewed that in my YouTube channel. So check it out that uh, that particular video. There are several courses in Coursera and edX that offers free certification, uh, including the bioinformatics. Uh, okay, so that you can actually check it. Okay, so uh, yeah. Uh, even the Ivy League universities like uh, uh, Harvard and Stanford and uh, Princeton is offering free certification programs only during the COVID-19 lockdown period. So, you know, it's a, uh, it's a very small investment and you can actually do that, uh, the, this one, okay? So you can, you can check it out. Uh, I think uh, all is clear uh, to our audience and students. Uh, Dr. Kriti. Now, any yeah, uh, uh, any participant uh, from my faculty or my colleagues, you want to ask questions? Please go ahead. Yes, Hello. students and uh, yes, Asim, please ask. Sir, I want to ask a question. Which Sir, which books do you recommend uh, for beginners in bioinformatics? Beginner bioinformatics book, uh, well, I am not really, uh, I I don't really have any idea as of now, if you ask me. But yeah, you can you can check out, uh, you know, there are several books are available uh, from the Cambridge University. I used to have that uh, interesting book. It's a low price edition of the Cambridge University Press red color which i forgot the name exactly i don't remember it yeah and bioinformatics as i told you it's a it's a huge discipline you know everything you can you can say that uh, by using the informatics onto the biology right so instead of starting with the bioinformatics textbook i suggest you to learn if you're a biologist learn some informatics for example if you're a, a botany student i suggest you to take a course on artificial intelligence ai is trending these days and you might think, okay, AI is a very, very complicated discipline, artificial intelligence. So you really need a degree in computer science to take it. No, nothing like that. Even a high school student can take the course which I'm recommending. And the course I recommend is called Elements of AI, Elements of Artificial Intelligence offered by University of Helsinki. And the course is only two weeks and it's fun, super fun, lots of games. And it's a, it's a, it's a great course. And they give you free certification. You know, and uh, yeah, I took the course almost three years back and I still remember some of the interesting, uh, you know, interesting games, for some bot man game. I still remember. So it is an amazing course. I suggest you to take it. And if you have the other way around, if you are from computer science uh, to go with, uh, to learn a little bit of the biology pathways and all, uh, start with maybe if you want to work on uh, a docking, then maybe a biochemistry book by Leninger could be a good starting point. So it all depends on exactly what you want to do, right? Yeah. And so uh, will you be, uh, in the next uh, session also, uh, will you be showing some uh, tools that we can use some live demonstrations and like that? No, there is no other session planned for today. You know, and uh, in case you want, maybe we can we can plan uh, it. Not Why for not? today. Uh, so that yeah, that you can request. Yeah, Azim, Azim, you can request that to your teacher if you want a session on mathematics. You know, why, why not? A, a new workshop you can organize. You can call some famous people who is actually working on some of these talking, and they can actually you know show how the softwares can be used. And if you really want to work on the molecular docking, then the software, the industry standard these days is Glide. Uh, it's by Schrodinger Corporation. Glide is a very fantastic software, but unfortunately it's very expensive. So if you have some, you know, budget, you can go for it. Uh, otherwise there are several free software, uh, docking software is available that also can get the things done if you know how to use it here.
Yeah, thank you, Azim. Now, sir, there is a question from Sonia Sharma. She wants to ask: There are reports from Delhi that people who live in slums have already developed antibodies inside them against COVID-19. What are you? What are? What is your viewpoint in this? Is it possible? And we can also say about. Yeah, yeah, that is excellent. I, I, yeah, I covered this one. Uh, I just told you about herd immunity. So herd immunity is actually a, it's a hitchhiker. It's basically uh, you are protected because all others are protected. <clears throat> you know, so that is exactly what is happening in the case of herd immunity. Uh, for example, everybody around you are rabies negative. You know, they all have the immunity against rabies. Uh, not rabies. Uh, for example, you know, uh, chicken pox. For example, and you don't have that problem. You know, you don't have the immunity. Then still, you are protected because you are living in a locality where everybody else is protected. That is called herd immunity. You know. So in the case of coronavirus, uh, that is true. Yeah, I mean, if you get disease, then you will the body will be produced antibodies against the uh, the the coronavirus. You know. And uh, are you prone for second infection? Again, some reports say that even if you get the first infection from COVID-19, you might get again reinfected, you know, but chances, I would say that uh, my personal opinion is pretty less and that because that is what the people, the scientists are saying. Now, coming to the, uh, this, uh, you know, the immunity in the Delhi, I, I say that this is true. Uh, the immunity, I mean, uh, in Bombay slums, for example, uh, reputed names have conducted the survey, you know, for example, TIFR, TFR is a very well known lab and they conducted that survey and they are saying that a uh, very good proportion have developed the uh, immunity. That's true. But the problem here is that even though they have immunity against COVID-19, even though they have antibodies in their blood plasma against COVID-19, they were infected in the first place. Now, what is their impact? You know, I lost one of my good friend recently, few weeks back, last week, in fact, he was COVID-19 positive. He discharged from the hospital. Uh, you know, of course, he was asymptomatic. Then on the same night, he died because of the silent attack. You know, heart attack is a very prevalent cause of death. And it, it is, uh, mostly remain unreported. And uh, most of the people dying out of heart attack are not classified as COVID-19. These are something called comorbidity or comortality. Uh, people dying out of something else after recovering from the disease are not really classified as COVID-19. So that is the reason that have, just having antibodies in the blood doesn't say anything. It doesn't convey any meaningful information, you know. So uh, preventing the infection is, that is our very important challenge right now, rather than talking about the herd immunity. And herd immunity, I can also give you a very interesting example of Sweden. There is a Scandinavian country you might know. Uh, one of the, you know, uh, uh, happiness index is very high. Uh, the standard of living is extremely high. Very rich country, Northern European country, Sweden. And Sweden, they experimented with herd immunity in the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. There were no lockdown in Sweden. Schools were open, you know, and people were interacting. They were hoping that this herd immunity would help them to fight the COVID-19. But what has happened is that Sweden saw a huge case probably the one of the worst affected countries in the Euro was Sweden. And that is the reason they actually started enforcing the lockdown, you know, so uh, that, that didn't work in Sweden. So, uh, yeah, it might not work anywhere else as well. So herd immunity is not an answer. Yeah. Over to Dr. Amar. Thank you, sir. Now over to Dr. Amar. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Uh, there is another question, sir from uh, Durgesh Chaurasia. So my question is out of this session, how safe is it to attend the competitive exams in this pandemic, especially in rural area where people are not taking precautions for COVID-19? Yeah, well, competitive exam, it's again, it's a, you know, it's a two-faced two coin. First of all, if you don't take it, then what about your future? Right. So UGC have now said that, OK, we are conducting exams. Students were protect testing Arm with UGC. Basically, the exams needs to be conducted. Otherwise, how the students, the future of the students are uh, getting affected. You know uh, what UGC says that you have to take adequate precaution and the conduct the exam. And, uh, you know, the then the students are protesting that decision based on uh, the COVID-19. The, the problem is that what UGC says is actually for the students. 
you know the students future is really important and that is the reason this exam need to be conducted and uh, two weeks back we also conducted in our university the uh, in the cucet central university is common interest test i was an invigilator so the, the the point is that whenever you go for this kind of competitive exam tomorrow is another exam you know major exam that is uh, iit je uh, advanced right so uh, when you go to that exam my suggestion is that because a lot of people will come wear mask and face shield these two things are important but je i don't think they will allow you uh, you know your own mask or your own face shield because they have lots of pro protocols but if you are taking any other competitive exam you can bring your own mask and your your own face shield so face shield is especially important if you go to that kind of places or if you are taking a, a, a you know a public transportation for example a, a, you know a bus uh unfortunately here in punjab and here in bathinda i haven't seen people wearing face shield even mask wearing is pretty less face shield is not expensive it's only uh, you know 40 rupees per piece you can buy online and face shield actually prevents uh, you know the uh, the droplets and aerosols so make it a habit wear a, a cloth mask and on the top you wear a face shield so uh, that is my uh, message so yeah in rural areas people are not protecting i mean uh, you know uh, protecting themselves but again the center the test center is not in rural area right there you have to go to a nearest city and how do you travel if you don't have money of course you have to go by bus so all these are really important no even traveling in bus is not safe unless you take precaution you know the taking precaution is more important yes and wearing mask doesn't mean that just by putting mask you are protected no there are several important thing for example if you are wearing a mask you know for example here is my mask from so wearing it you know i can wear it like this right where then i when then i keep on touching this front part you know this part i touch i touch no never touch this area if you ever touch it you have to properly wash your hands that's really really important because after one or two hour use very high chances that this area will have corona viruses you know and instead of this you have to always hold it on the sides this mask is absolutely fine because this is a new mask i don't i don't have any problem otherwise touching the front part is impossible if you do that chances of getting virus infection is higher than not wearing mask you know so you should know how to use it properly that is for scientific literacy and if you actually uh, temporarily if you want to remove it just hanging bag on on the chin again bag you know or putting into your pocket no never do that so once you remove the mask you know what you have to do is that you have to uh, you know fold inside out and then put that into a ziplock bag a plastic bag store it and then take out turn inside out again and wear it so there are several ways that these are really really important and don't take it lightly yeah thank you sir for you know uh, giving us a technique to how to wear a mask properly and how to hold and how to store it after using it now i would like to invite my colleagues to ask questions yes from the participants students can also ask question if if you are having okay then there is one question from dr gurpreet singh he wants to ask uh, is there any climatic factor on which the uh, virus is uh, depends like i can say that temperature cold conditions yeah earlier uh, people were saying that when the temperature rise uh, when it becomes hot uh, it will be less so because when the corona virus started coming Uh, countries hot countries were less affected like india was so very less affected you know comparing with colder countries like uh, europe uh, you know europe uh, uh, for example germany or uh, spain or italy was so worst affected and we were saying that well we are safe because we are really hot country and covid 19 will i mean there are even papers uh, published paper that says this but this is all pseudo science or fake news you know so covid 19 is basically infectious this is it's all transmit uh, based on our personal hygiene and how we actually take the precautions 
quarantine works, lockdown work, or what our government has done, impose a lockdown, the prime minister has done, it works. You know, it's, it, this is the same stuff. This is a scientific stuff. Not wearing mask and uh, doing the immune booster, no, that is not science. You know, so this is really important and there is no uh, thing on uh, the uh, climate or the weather. Uh, the climate is different. Climate is like a, a much, much geological time, you know. It's more uh, on the weather, the local weather condition, right? <clears throat> Now coming to the weather, there is a there is actually a spurious connection here. Uh, there is a very interesting paper published by NPL, National Physical Laboratory, CSAR lab in the New Delhi. Uh, of course, they collaborate with the French team, I mean German team, and they published their finding in physical reviews. A fantastic paper, and unfortunately, I didn't read a single mention of that paper in Indian media. Indian media has got no time to uh, speak on this kind of paper. You know, they, they have time only about uh, Hollywood uh, suicides or, uh, you know, uh, whatever the, the things are actually happening here. Politics are everywhere in the TV, right? This paper by NPL team in India, what they found is that humidity with uh, aerosol transmission. So what will happen the, when you cough or sneeze or when you even speak, you know, the droplets transports. Right. So how this microscopic droplets called aerosols travel in different humidity. So uh, if the humidity higher is better or lower is better. So what they found is that if the humidity is higher, that means after the rain and the humidity is pretty high, then the aerosols become larger and it cannot travel farther. So high humidity is better for uh, controlling the, the COVID-19 disease. That is what the paper says. It's a great finding. Earlier, I was thinking that humidity is bad. You know, usually uh, when, they, when it rains, you get the cold and other conditions, right? And, uh, you know, when it is dry, then I thought that this aerosol might dry up, you know, and uh, aerosols are nothing but droplet. It can dry up and infection will be less. No, you know, drier is worst. Because basically, the aerodrops can travel much further. You know, and there was another, uh, I mean, that is that's what the weather relation. Another story came, I think, Assam governor, <coughs> a BJP governor, and he said that, uh, you know, in, in the house, uh, the legislature assembly, don't speak loudly, because if you speak loudly, uh, COVID-19 will transmit, <laughs> you know, what a, a farcical comment, isn't it? People started criticizing and even Hindu, paper ran a story about it and people in the Facebook and Twitter, they started sharing, mocking that governor, what the governor says is nonsense. You know, if you speak loud, the COVID-19 will transmit and the don't speak loud, no, uh, whisper. But what the governor said is scientifically right. Because if you speak loud, you know, the droplets are being produced a lot higher and there are studies in PNAS paper, you know, uh, Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, there has been a study on church choir. You know, the choir, the singers in the church, if they sing much higher tone and at much higher volume, then infection is much higher. You know, that is scientific evidence. What the governor said is true. You know, it is not uh, fake news or pseudoscience. So people here in India celebrate something true as an untrue and something untrue as true, like uh, immune boosters. So what an irony, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's, it is rightly said, sir. You are, uh, your talk is really enlightening for us and you totally, I, I, I'm sure that you will just close, open the eyes of the participants who are just, you know, not believing that COVID is there and all that stuff. Yeah. Now over to Dr. Amar. You want to take the last question? Uh, I think uh, uh, all the queries uh, are solved by now because Sarah has explained uh, it very well and in the deep. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for being here with us. Now a last call from my colleagues and the participants. Uh, you want to ask any question from the sir? Yes, Sne, you can ask for your question.
If you are asking, please unmute. I think she is not. So I am taking up the last question by Anju Gurg. She wants to ask: uh, Is there any COVID vaccine available till now? Like Russia has, you know, released a vaccine. And uh, what is the efficacy effic efficiency of this vaccine? And uh, according to you, uh, how much time you know COVID will take? This pandemic will take to go over. Okay, that is a million dollar question. The final question, where, where no one has an answer. How long will it take? Maybe years. Who knows? <clears throat> and vaccine coming to the vaccine, the, the China made a, the claim. They, they said that it's a Sputnik. You know, Sputnik One is a vaccine. Uh, it's like Sputnik is the name of the uh, first ever satellite or so. That is actually a right clue. Now the Sputnik vaccine, many experts have raised uh, their uh, queries that there is no uh, human trials conducted. Now they are thinking of conducting human tr clinical trials in India. You know, so without human trials, marketing success is. Uh, you know, it's just a, a, a propaganda, I would say. It's a socialist, communist propaganda. So I don't trust the, the Chinese, uh, I mean, the, the Soviet, uh, the Russian, the current Russian uh, government, and even the opposition leader is now completely uh, poisoned. You know, uh, they have actually intolerance of difference of opinion. The Chinese opposition leader is uh, completely poisoned and uh, now it's under treatment in uh, Berlin. Uh, that is what has happened in Russia, you know. So, but earlier Soviet Union were really good during the Cold War time. They were really good with science and technology. But nowadays, Russia is pathetic. Uh, Russia comes in news oftentimes because they're still good with the defense and sports. You know, every Olympics, Russians get lots of medals and in defense as well. They have elaborate defense system and also nuclear power. They have lots of nuclear stock. Uh, because of the Cold War legacy. Other than that, the vaccine that what uh, Russians claim is uh, highly unlikely to be true. The reason is that you really need to have a proper open science guidelines. You know, there are some established guidelines. And if you think that we don't have to follow any of these guidelines and we can simply claim it to be uh, true, no, that is not how the science works. Science is open for criticism, you know. And if you think that, well, we are beyond uh, the criticism don't criticize me uh, i can share you one my one of my example uh, i think four years ago i was just walking in the streets of delhi and then i saw an advertisement uh, you know the poster on the on the walls of delhi the the Pernod place area and the wall shows a, a book you know golden color book and the book i will not say which book it is you know because uh, i'm sure when i say it it's going to be a controversy I don't want to cut the controversy or pop the hornets, uh, you know, uh, nest again. So the book says, uh, the, the notice says, read our book. The book has never been revised for the last 400 years. Last 400 years, nobody revised that book. And they claim that it's a, something very good. Now let us imagine our science book. You know, let us say that this science book haven't been revised for 400 years. What would have happened? We would still learn that Earth is flat, not even round, you know. They, we will still think that Earth is the center of the universe. Sun is, uh, you know, revolving around the Earth. You know, that is basically the uh, uh, Ptolemaic uh, proposition, right? The geocentric Earth, uh, not even Copernican uh, proposition, right? So all these things were Galileo and proposition of the uh, heliocentrism all came later. So, you know, the science is all about learning from failure. That's really important for the science, you know, and uh, if you if you say that, okay, don't criticize me, then that kind of organizations, even even management, you know, even your uh, college, DAV college should be open for the criticism. Like our university is also open. We always conduct student feedback survey and teacher feedback survey too. Student can you know grade the teachers, and if uh, the students are not satisfied with the way I teach, they can directly anonymously they can report the matter to the higher up authority, and that is very important for any organization. You know, the feedback for the improvement in, in Japanese they call it as kaizen. 
continuous improvement that is why the japanese uh, uh, you know car brands like toyota mitsubishi honda suzuki all these are uh, very very popular or uh, you know sony and you know all these panasonic all these electronic gadgets because they keep on learning for whenever they make a mistake so kaizen is important and this feedback loop mechanism of self improvement is important so uh, that is what is lacking in uh, the russian vaccine claim they are not open they didn't reveal any detail uh, to whom they tried but it's not the case with uh, the vaccine which i just told you about uh, the story of the moderna's mrna vaccine everything is open or chadox and cov1 vaccine of oxford university and astrazeneca the swedish uh, you know the uh, uh, pharma giant so the trials are really open so you have to be open otherwise uh, you know science will never progress thank you yeah thank you sir for such a wonderful talk on bioinformatics and you gave a lot of information on covid vaccine and uh, also the masks and all that stuff uh, now i would like to all of my participants in the zoom please uh, just uh, share your uh, just switch on your camera so that, so that we can get a screenshot of your uh, participation students also please yes and may all the faculty members please switch on your camera mode azim hello yeah you can switch on your camera the uh, ram already Yeah, done. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful talk, and we are having a great pleasure to have with you. And it's almost uh, two hours, and you we are up shoot up up shooting the session also. Yeah, thank you so much. Now, Dr. Amar, you want to thank say you. something? Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Bye. Please wear mask and goodbye. Yeah, thank Hello, you. Hello, sir. sir. Can we can we get the resources that you shared during the talk? Uh, this entire talk is archived in the YouTube. You can always go back. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.